Amen. Just this this morning, this time is just a reminder of, you know, the whole theme is God's faithfulness in every season. You are not alone. He is with you. And so we're just going to have a couple um, ladies share their testimony and just what God has put on their hearts for this time, just to encourage us that he get, that God is faithful in every season. And so I just speak that you're encouraged over by these words that are about to come forward. Um, first is going to be uh, Rebecca Orozco, and Rebecca has been a part of our church for a long time, and she's going to just share an awesome testimony. I know you're going to be encouraged by this, guys. It's amazing. So can we just give her a welcome? Can I her feel welcome? Thank you so much. This has been um, a really exciting season getting ready for this and uh, looking back in my journals and seeking the Lord and writing my testimony, my story. It's been really exciting. And uh, thank you, Kathy, for inviting me to speak. This is my setting. <laughs> this is perfect. And I don't know if you realized it when you asked me to speak a couple months ago. I certainly didn't realize it, but um, we've dedicated as a church um, February, for February Forgiveness. And I wrote my story out, and it's called The Weapon of Forgiveness. <laughs> so that was totally the Holy Spirit. So uh, it's a simple story that has a miraculous birth, a death, a beautiful forgiveness. Amazing acts of God and a resurrection. Does that sound Amen. like a familiar story, maybe, maybe a good one? It sounds like Christ's story, but it points to Christ. So like any good story, uh, it begins with a miraculous birth, and it was the miraculous birth of my nephew, Rockford Ray Muir, in July of two 2013. And uh, this is my lovely sister here. This was her son. Why was it miraculous? Well, he was a vasectomy baby. What occurred was called recanalization. Basically, the body parts that were snipped <laughs> completely grew back together. The doctor who did this procedure had never seen this happen in over 20 years of practice. Um, I think the statistic at that time in 2013 was one in 2,500. So. I'm going with miraculous, <laughs> miraculous birth of my nephew. Now, who was I at this time? There is no pretty way to say it. There's no words. I can't beat around the bush. Guys, I was religious, super religious, very uh, formula type thinking. It's funny that Randy a couple months ago said something. You never know you're religious until you're on the other side and you're free. I had no clue. No clue I was religious. But um, pastor did speak a word over me at that time, and he said, the Lord is taking me to be from a Martha to a Mary, and that was prophetic. I had a very formula-type thinking. If I look like this, if I speak like this, then you, God, will keep me from the bad things. You'll keep my kids on this path. Very non relationship but very uh, works mindset and thinking performance based that's how I viewed God so I was religious I was also extremely overworked I was homeschooling my six kids and I was watching five other kids in my home if you showed up at my house on any given day of the week I might have 11 kids there that I was caring for nurturing under this religious mindset, but Kathy spoke a prophetic word over me at that time, and she said, you know, it's just a season, and it will end, and it ended very abruptly, and she spoke prophetically. So here I am, religious, overworked. What does that cause? I was sick, totally sick. I was experiencing severe heart palpitations. If you don't know what that is, it's arrhythmia of the heart very irregular beats, which in cause ter causes um, anxiety, panic attacks. I had had a scan done on my body, and they, he had seen West Nile in my body. So here I am, absolutely religious, overworked, and very sick. 
and it sounds like a good time for the Lord to move, right? A good, a good stew for God to work in, and he did. I, um, it was on one of these panic-stricken anxiety nights, and the date was 11-11-13, and I cried out to the Lord in a very Garden of God Gethsemane prayer when the Lord said, take this cup from me. I prayed, and I said, Lord, never ask me to bury a child. Never ask that of me. And I'm crying out to the Lord in my religious, I'm doing all the works that I'm supposed to be doing. Keep me from that. The next morning was 11, 12, 13. Started like any other. The children began to arrive, and one of them was my nephew, Rocky, we called him. He was fussy that morning. I'm going to spare a lot of details. He was fussy, and I laid him down. And I went to have my Bible time, my religious duty, giving the first part of my day to the Lord. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Rocky did not wake up from that nap. And guys, this was the veil, the religious veil torn right there, completely rent. You know, the night that when Jesus died, the veil was torn, and that was the religious system was torn. That's what happened to me. I could no longer stand and say, I'm doing these things. You were supposed to do these things. The mindset of religion was broken right there. You hear people being, like, instantly healed. That was me. I couldn't stand in religion anymore when this awful thing had happened. Uh, I'm just going to interject right here. An autopsy was done. It came back undetermined. They label that as SIDS. He was a perfect candidate for SIDS. White male under four months in, in the cold season. So whatever I say from here, the, the outcome was SIDS. And that, um, that didn't stop Satan from torturing my mind. I opened the door to the what ifs. People's words were torturous on me. Oh, you never lay a baby on its belly. Satan came in. You did that. What if you hadn't laid him on his belly? Oh, you never leave a hat on a baby. You left his hat on him. You never let a baby cry it out. These guys, I was being completely tortured. Satan was stealing my sound mind. I would wake up at 3 a.m. every night, like tortured. Just, I did this. I took this baby's life completely toward, I would, I would sit and rock like this. I, I don't remember the other kids. I, like I said, I had six kids at that time. I don't remember life happening around me. I know you guys brought food. Y'all were on my doorstep. My mom was there. Alex was there watching me. I was completely going crazy. My, my husband thought I was going crazy because Satan was just coming in and tearing me down with these what ifs. I remember sitting at the funeral, and Satan told me, everyone is here because of something you've done. This is how tormented I was. That was on a Tuesday. I arrive at church on a Sunday, and Karen saw it almost immediately. She was like, you are under a complete demonic attack. Do you not see it? And I was like, I don't see it. I've killed a baby. That, my mind was just there. And... When Karen said that, Kathy had people praying for me round the clock. Guys, I felt y'all's prayers. I felt the prayers of my church family. Y'all carried me in that time. Okay, here's my little commercial. I can look out and I can see most of you are a church family. And y'all are amazing. Y'all are amazing. Thank you. Kathy was in my home brushing hair. Y'all all all brought food and those things. Now... If you are sitting here and you don't have a church family, find one today. Go find a church where people love you. We're one. Get plugged in. Althea, how important is a church family? Insanely important. Okay, there's my little commercial. (laughs) Thank you guys for being everything that I needed. But Satan continued to give these these what-ifs in my mind. And I needed something more. We all know that... The cross is available for all of us, right? But he's limited himself to you. 
The cross has no power over you unless you receive it. It has to be received. The cross is available, forgiveness is available, but you must receive it. And I had to have that for my sister. I had to receive that forgiveness, so I had to go to her. And I had to say, what if? What if this happened because I laid him on his belly? What if this happened because I left his hat on him? And she said the most amazing thing. I've never blamed you. I don't blame you. God is doing something. This is bigger than you, and you're forgiven. This was like receiving Christ's forgiveness. This was like receiving the cross, Christ's forgiveness, right here. This was me saying, you know what? I'm going to receive that. I take it, and now I had a weapon against Satan. Next time he came to me and he said, you left his hat on, but I'm forgiven. You laid him on his belly, but I'm forgiven. Yeah. Guys, we've got to take the cross, not just as the cross, but as a weapon of forgiveness when he says, I know what you did as a mom, but I'm forgiven. I saw you yell at your husband, but I'm forgiven. Christ says, our sin is far as from the east is from the west. That's powerful. That means it's gone. Totally gone. He remembers our sin no more. And that's what I received from my sister. And I began to use it like a weapon. And I began to have natural feeling, natural healing that occurs when you have a loss. I began to heal naturally. And uh, what Kathy spoke, my, my, uh, my season of watching children, that was over. I began to rest. I began to heal. I physically got better. I began to seek the Lord for who he was. And uh, instead of just in religious rote. Um, even though I had healing, we were coming up on uh, Rocky's first birthday, the, uh, the anniversary of Rocky's first birthday. And those days, uh, those anniversaries, they're hard on this side of heaven, and they're going to be. And so it was the eve of his first birthday, and I was crying out to the Lord, and I need something to stand on tomorrow. I need, I need a word from you. So I just opened the Bible. And I went directly to this word. And it was the high priest that spoke over Jesus before he died. And he spoke prophetically and he said, isn't it better that one man should die, that a whole nation be saved? And the Lord said, look what I've done. Look how I've been glorified through this death. Rocky's brother, Caden, was 11 at the time. He heard the voice of the Lord for the first time after this death, and he told him, I'm doing something. I'm doing something with this death. It's big, and it's going to be through you. And Caden accepted the call of a pastor. Right now, he's leading a Bible study at his school, at Saxe High School, and they had to move from a classroom to the auditorium because over 60 kids came to hear the word of the Lord because Rocky passed. Rocky's own father, he was a fear monger, and when he passed, he was freed, he chose Christ, he was baptized because Rocky died. A whole family that was at the funeral said, I'm going to make this death matter, yeah. and they all were baptized and chose to serve the Lord, they're active in their church. Another couple that was there at the funeral rededicated their life, the work that he did in me. The Lord has been glorified through this, the list goes on. Stacy could probably write a book on the people that have sought the Lord because of what's happened, because of Rocky's death. In our own church family, Kim has shared that after Rocky passed, her perspective changes. Her children have a happier, healthier mom because of Rocky's death. And the Lord opened my eyes and showed me that. So we've had a uh, miraculous birth and we've had a death and a forgiveness and amazing acts of God. Now, where's my resurrection? It comes in an interesting form. Rocky is not with us, obviously. He's not with us, and, and uh, we can't question why because the Lord's done so much since then. But where's my resurrection? It comes in a really, really interesting form, so bear with me. <laughs> it came in July of the following year, July 4th, the Sunday before July 4th, and if you've been in my church family long, you know that I'm a super dork, and I love to dress my kids up matching, and July 4th is one of those days, and 
I had my girls in their white dresses, their red, white, and blue. And uh, Pastor Carol had bought a sheet cake to celebrate the independence with red, white, and blue icing. Thank you for that. <laughs> and we had a, uh, a potluck that Sunday. And when you have the largest family in the church, you get to take all the food home. Thank you, church family. <laughs> Y'all always feed us on Mondays. Thank you. And Alex had decided to stay home from church, uh, I mean, stay home and play football with the men. So it was a completely different day. I had all this food, my kids are soiled, Alex is not with me, and I pull up at the house in the van, and I just delegated people, you take that, you take that, you take that, you take that. We all go in the house. We begin our Sunday afternoon activities. I'm scrubbing out dresses, I'm putting food away, I'm scrubbing dresses, hanging them on the line, and the Lord says to me, where's Bethy? Just a simple, where's Bethy? And that's my baby. Bethy's my youngest. There's no reason I should have thought about Bethy at that moment. I'm working. I'm doing things. I thought I saw her go upstairs with the other children. I sent a kid, go, go find Bethy. Let me look at her dress. She's not upstairs. Okay, look in both bathrooms. She's not in both bathrooms. Look outside in the backyard. She's not anywhere. I'm beginning to panic now, and then I remembered we all came in the house, and we all had our hands full. It's been 15 minutes. July 4th, Texas. I run out to the van, and I put my head up to the glass, and, and there she is, covered head to toe in her car seat, sweat, crying. And the Lord, but she was alive. And the Lord resurrected her from that van. And this was my e Emmaus Way moment when I saw the face of the Lord. I didn't realize it then. But he reminded me of that, the prayer I asked him the night before Rocky passed. Don't ask me to bury a child. He spoke to me out of nothing. I shouldn't have thought about Bethy. He spoke an audible word to me. You can't tell me that Christ isn't moving today that he's not working miraculously. He saved my baby from the van. That was the answer to that prayer. And I pray that this story leads you back to the cross, back to the amazing acts of what he does. Thank you. Thank you.